That's that's not. It's just not true. Kubernetes is not going to fix everything. It, it may be a solution that you need, but as you see from the meme here, you know, Anakin says we use Kubernetes now, and Padme is so excited. She's like, because it's going to simplify our operations, right? And Anakin just gives her the death stare, and she's like, it's going to simplify everything, right? Well, no, not necessarily. Padme, thing, some things may actually get harder uh, with Kubernetes, uh, and, and we'll talk about that as we keep going here. But first, we got to figure out how we got here. So um, many years ago, some of you will recognize these boxes here. This is where we started. We had standalone, big, clunky servers, and you had to spin up your OS on them. And we called it spinning up because we actually used a CD that would spin. That's why you spin up an OS, right? Um, and then, then we moved on and we're like, hey, let's, we're going to be fancy and we're going to have these big uh, blades and they're going to go in racks and it's going to be so much better. And uh, and they were power hungry, and you still had to. They still came with little CD drives on the front. You still had to spin up and and load every single one. And then some amazing company named VMware came along, and uh, really started you know showing the world the wonders of virtualization. And so from there, we started uh, having hypervisors. Right, you took your server, it became a hypervisor, and we started doing uh, VMs. You started having VMs for everything. And that was great for things like a Windows server or a SQL server, something that was going to run for a long time. It was it was wonderful, right? You were utilizing resources and and uh, you were able to keep everything back. You were able to back everything up. But where it wasn't so great was for things like web servers that may be short lived or that may need to uh, grow with with uh, demand and may need to shrink when there's not demand. And so VMs kind of had a tendency to sprawl. You got kind of locked in because you would you would put so many, you know, you you give two cores and four gig of RAM to a VM, and maybe that little web server doesn't really need that, but now you've allocated it and it's just sitting there doing nothing. So the second problem that came along was that developers were creating code on their machines, and then they would push their code to a code repository. And then we would try to install the code directly onto the VM. And that led to the, the problem uh, that we always joke about, which is it works on my machine. Because they go back to the developer and say, it doesn't work. We put it in the production and it, it doesn't work. And the developer would say, well, it works on my machine. And so the, the way around this was containers. And we figured out that we could take a container with the code in it and then just ship the whole container into the server. And then we didn't have all these dependency problems anymore. So let's talk about um, security for a second. <clears throat> and we'll continue to talk about this evolution of, of how we got to where we are today. In, in a traditional uh, setup, a monolithic application is what we used to call it. You have, uh, this, this represents our firewall here on the outside. And you would have your servers and they would be uh, exposed across the firewall, like a web server and an email server. And, and you'd have your app uh, and it was all running in this big monolithic environment that you could control. And you only had a couple teams. You had a network security and infrastructure team kind of all rolled into one because most of your security was based on this firewall. And then you had a development team and, and that was it. And, and you had pretty uh, simple things to think about. You had your hypervisors, your VMs, you had a big monolithic or unified app, you had a firewall, and you had managed devices all inside your organization. But now fast forward, and the modern approach to, app, to building an application is much different. Now everything is very distributed. You can see here, the border has become squishy. It's not a it's not a hard border anymore around around your environment. You may have multiple clouds. Uh, you have people who are bringing their own devices. You have mobile workers. You've got uh, just you have SaaS applications that you don't even control, but you're using their services for your app. And so now uh, this environment requires many teams. We have platform engineer, developer, cloud engineer, SOC analyst, network and infrastructure, DevOps. There, there's just so many teams. And one of the things that I like to point out is that it doesn't take very long at all 
before as an organization, you no longer have one person who knows your entire environment. Now, take a second and let that sink in. If you have any size at all, it is doubtful that you have one person in your environment that understands the whole environment. You have to get several people in a room that collectively have the knowledge for all the different pieces of technology that you're running. And, and that becomes a problem because we have to figure out how to be able to get visibility and how do we know if something is actually wrong? So uh, I just want to point out one more thing. We talked about how it was pretty easy with the monolithic. We knew uh, what we had in our environment, but now look at all the things we have. Uh, you've got clouds, on-prem cloud, container platform, complex ingress, distributed apps, bring your own devices, automation tools, Git repos, image repositories, so much stuff. Uh, very quickly, it becomes overwhelming. And I'm trying to get my slide to go forward and it's not obeying me. Hold on guys, my my computer, you can still hear me though, right? I didn't freeze. Okay. Yeah, we can still hear you. My Mac decided that it does not wanna let me. Uh... All right, we're gonna get there. And Knox, if you need me to, I have the slides pulled up. I can always uh, share my screen. Oh, yeah. We may have to pull an audible here if I can't figure <laughs> out why my why my uh, Mac decided to keep working but not give me a mouse anymore. My mouse pointer just disappeared, and then everything kind of – oh, oh, it came back. I, we don't understand why these things happen, we but, but we're back now, so I apologize. Okay. So now moving forward. <clears throat> so – we came up with a new paradigm for how we even develop these applications. We have, uh, you have a developer and they push their code to a Git repository. And then almost instantly, most of the time, once that code gets pushed, it starts down a CI CD process it could be where it's building a container, you have pipelines and all kinds of things are happening. And once it passes through all those things and a container is built, uh, usually the, the container itself is pushed off into a repository. Many times it's something like a harbor. And then from there, it waits until uh, it's pulled into a Kubernetes environment. And so it gets pulled in here. You see you've got a cloud layer. It could be vSphere, AWS, you know, Azure, Google. You have a cluster layer where you have your clusters. You have containers that are at a container level, usually in a namespace. And then there's code inside that container. But so because of this, though, there are, there are new problems. Now we have to worry about applications that have vulnerabilities. Uh, allowing vulnerabilities into our environment during this build process. And so now uh, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are shifting left and trying to get security into the process as early as possible. So kind of continuing on with that same idea, you've got a dev machine, your developer pushes to, to some repository. In this case, I just have GitLab up here. And immediately he begins to build an image. And this is where for Carbon Black Container, we immediately jump into action. You can incorporate your scanning into your build process. And we'll look at that here in a little bit when I get to the live demo. So that as it goes through the CI CD process, you can scan the images in your pipeline and you can have policies set up. And if these images do not meet the criteria that you set up, your pipeline will fail. Uh, if there's a vulnerability that needs to be remediated or something like that, or malware or something else is found that, like I said, you have a policy and it says, nope, it did not uh, validate and it fails. So the logs from this kind of scanning go uh, into the Carbon Black Cloud so your security team can see them. And the logs also uh, come out in your CI CD process in the pipeline, which I love because you can see both. Your DevOps team is getting the results of those scans and they can see them. Your uh, security team is getting those results in the cloud. We have a Harbor plugin now uh, where you can also, once you push your 
uh, images to harbor and they're waiting to be deployed, it could be a week or two before you actually use uh, that deployment. And while it's sitting there in harbor, uh, you can set up scanning for an hour, a day, whatever you want. Uh, and so if new vulnerabilities come to light, new zero days come out, uh, these are getting scanned continu continually and you'll be able to know about them and be able to get alerts. And of course we have policies uh, before we deploy to make sure that the images uh, meet certain criteria. And we'll talk about those later as well. So Carbon Black has got you covered at all three spots here in the build, deploy, run life cycle. We're gonna be watching over uh, the life cycle of that container as it goes forward. And Nox, just a quick, uh, wanna reiterate your point on the um, image scanning since that was uh, one part of Ahmed's question. Um, mm -hmm. Can you cover again the frequency in which we're, we're scanning those images? Yeah, so, um, and, and, and to, to answer your question, um, Ahmed, from earlier, the, the scanning should start immediately. Uh, I'll show when I get to the demo here this morning, I created these clusters this morning and immediately scanning started to happen. So we're gonna have to figure out what's going on if you're not getting immediate scanning, because as soon as, as, soon as the cluster is deployed and Carbon Black is connected to that cluster, it should start scanning everything in the cluster. Uh, then it will continually scan uh, your images in your cluster based on uh, whatever time frame you set up. So your cluster should be getting continually scanned. And again, it's that same concept as here in Harbor because if you have processes or Kubernetes components that are long running components uh, and new vulnerabilities come to light, you need to know that. And unless you're doing this kind of scanning continually, how do you know? How do you know that the version of Cube Proxy or the version of the Kubernetes API that you're running, that that container doesn't have a new vulnerability and you need to update it uh, as soon as possible? Thank so you. securing each layer, uh, Carbon Black, we're trying to secure each layer. And in this particular case, we're just talking about, we are specifically looking at the Kubernetes layer today. So let's talk about uh, cloud native real quick. When we talk about Kubernetes, um, we're talking about a cloud native uh, approach to development. And it usually has these four pillars that we think of, uh, microservices that you're gonna break down that monolithic application into its smaller pieces so that they can be uh, delivered quickly. Uh, you're gonna containerize your application so that it can go anywhere. That's kind of the promise of Kubernetes that it can run in any cloud and that you can, uh, once you get your container built, you should be able to deploy it anywhere. Uh, I always like to point out though, that the bad guys like that too, because that means that the bad guys can build a container and it'll run anywhere. And that makes the bad guys happy because now they, it's easier for them to deploy things and to try to get a, uh, a bad image into your environment and then it'll run anywhere. Continuous delivery, uh, cloud native is, uh, the cloud native methodology is set up to where you should be able to iterate very quickly and your dev teams are continually making new features and adding and you're able to uh, deploy them in a, in a very rapid um, manner. And even if things go wrong, because of this continuous delivery, you should also be able to immediately pivot. So if you realize, oh no, that was a bad version, you can roll back to one that was working quickly, uh, or you could just go ahead and fix it and just push that patch right out. DevSecOps. So uh, the other pillar, the last pillar here is DevSecOps, that you are uh, collaborating between your development team and your security team and your operations team and that they are able to uh, communicate, they're able to shift that security earlier in the process, they're able to make all these other things happen where they're having the continuous delivery and these teams should be working together hand in hand. Now the risks uh, with containers and Kubernetes. So a couple of the big risks here are third party images. Uh, You've got to be really careful about this. It is so easy to just go to Docker Hub and pull an image, but Docker Hub is not checking out those images. Just because someone puts an image in Docker Hub does not make it safe. Uh, I could make a terrible image and put it in Docker Hub and just hope that people download it or go out and promote it and get people to download it. Just because it's there doesn't mean you can trust it. And so we have to be very careful about where we're uh, starting with our image registries. 
and make sure that we're getting uh, our images from reputable sources, whether it's uh, like Tanzu, um, you can you can get a subscription with Tanzu and get their Bitnami images um, that have already had uh, vulnerabilities remediated um, and that you know it's coming straight from them and that it's clean. But no matter where you get them at, you've got to make sure that you've done your homework and they're clean. Ephemeral nature of containers, this is a risk. Uh, containers are designed to be ephemeral, so they go up and down very quickly. It's very hard sometimes to monitor them and to know what's happening. So a bad container can come up and do a bad thing and then just go away. And if you don't have any kind of monitoring or, or something to check and make sure uh, what's going on in your environment, you won't know because that, that container has already come and gone. Speed of deployment, because things are happening, happening rapidly, uh, and, and I'm going to throw this second one here too, the complexity between the speed of deployment and the complexity. A lot of things can happen in your environment that you're just not aware of. And, and so a team may see something that looks a little fishy, right? It doesn't seem right, but because uh, they don't understand the whole environment, like we talked about earlier, it's too big. I don't know all the pieces of the environment. And because I don't know all those pieces, sometimes we just assume, oh, well, that's just the DevOps team doing something. Or the DevOps team assumes, oh, well, I guess that's just something that the dev team is doing. And they don't talk to each other and they don't verify. They just assume that everything's moving so fast and it's complex and I, I, I don't know. But because of that, uh, bad things can, can go under the radar. Bad things can go undetected because people just chalk it up to, well, it's just another team. It's not my business. I don't know what they're doing, nor do I have time to care what they're doing. So there has to be a way to be able to see and have visibility across uh, your entire life cycle to be able to know when something bad like this is happening. And we're going to look at that here in a moment as well. And real quick, Knox, so, can you... Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, can you touch on just a little bit too of like... Uh, you know, more on that complexity and the tool fatigue and and why you wouldn't want to use a separate tool to scan images and to secure containers at runtime than you would for, say, endpoints, networks. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, that's that's one of the things, and, and thanks for pointing that out because I take it for granted. I'm working with, with a carbon black container all the time, and so I take for granted the idea that Within Carbon Black Container, we're able to see all these things. We're able to, to start with the scanning, be able to also see uh, the clusters, and also be able to see now we're, we're, we're getting ready to add new features for seeing process monitoring in our containers. And if you're using Carbon Black across your wider organization and you're using our EDR or, your, or our XDR, then you can, in one pane of glass, be able to see uh, your developer machines, your other employee devices, and your environment. And now I have visibility across the developers, across the development environment, across my cloud, and I can see everything in one place. And my security team is not going to get fatigued uh, having to look at all these different things. Not only is, is my security team not going to get fatigued looking at all these tools, uh, sometimes the tools aren't even visible to the security team. So there are a lot of develop there are a lot of DevOps teams who are scanning their images, but they're using tools that are open source or are just made for scanning. And the the security team doesn't even have access to that. They they don't have access to the to the uh, CI CD pipelines and to those logs. And so they never see them. And those logs aren't going anywhere where they can see them. So they just have no visibility at all. Uh, so that's a great point, Abby. Um, you want to have you want to be able to have a tool that gives you that visibility across everything and allows your security team to do their job. And if they're already used to using Carbon Black, but maybe they don't know Kubernetes, this is wonderful because this is going to give them visibility into the environment without having to know how to be Kubernetes geniuses. So a couple other uh, right before we go to the demo here, these are some other common vulnerabilities that happen. Uh, and some of these we've already talked about. So common just, just for containers in general, images with critical vulnerabilities. Got to make sure we're, we're not using bad images. Containers running with the privilege flag. So you don't want to run your, your containers in privilege mode. Uh, that means as root. So if you're running a container as root and someone gets control of your container, then they have root instantly. And they don't even have to do any kind of privilege escalation. 
unrestricted communication between containers. Uh, a lot of people forget you stand up a container and it's allowed to talk to all the other containers around it. Uh, so you have to think about whether you are uh, doing some some micro segmentation, some networking between your containers to make sure that they're not uh, just all able to talk to each other across the network. Got to watch out for containers that are running rogue or malicious processes, uh, containers that are not properly isolated from the host, where uh, it could be a container where they've mounted the file system from the host, and that's very dangerous. Uh, with Kubernetes specifically, uh, remote access to workloads, you have to make sure that you are keeping uh, the access to the actual Kubernetes clusters, those, those cube config files, to only those that need them. Access to secrets, because Kubernetes secrets are not really secret. The secret is out. It's actually just base 64. That's all it is. If you've never gone into a Kubernetes secret and looked at it, it's it's literally whatever you put in, just base 64 encoded. And that's, that's not very secret. Access to cloud resources. Uh, someone can get inside your Kubernetes. And a lot of times that Kubernetes cluster is authorized to do things within your cloud. So they may be able to start spinning up resources. Storage provisioning, they may be able to start using up your storage. Uh, we need to make sure that you have role-based access controls in place uh, for your for your clusters. And again, same thing as with just regular containers, don't allow privileged pro processes to run or keep them at a minimum uh, for only for things that absolutely need them. All right. So now we're ready for the live demo. Let me go ahead and switch screens here. Uh, at this point, if somebody, if you got questions up to this point, feel free to ask them while I'm getting switched over here. Yeah, please put your all questions in the chat and, and we'll definitely um, answer them as we're going through the demo and, and then we'll leave additional time at the end there too. But, um, but yeah, as we're going through, um, I'll stop Knox with any, any questions. So again, put those in the chat there. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, now it's time for the fun stuff. Right, remind me how I'm doing for time, Roy. You're doing good. It is 826. If you want to do five, maximum 10 more minutes, that way we could cut the Q&A. OK. Um, so I'm going to show everybody real quick here. This is We saw this slide already over on the other one here. And we're going to start at the beginning and look at uh, a cluster that I spun up this morning. So just to show you. Um, I I have this set up now. If any of you are out there and you need to know about this, we can we can connect offline later. But I deploy my clusters in an automated fashion, and when I deploy the clusters, I install uh, Carbon Black into the cluster in an automated way. So uh, you don't have to do it manually. So when I when I make a brand new cluster, it immediately gets Carbon Black uh, upon its creation. So here is the. Uh, cluster that I spun up this morning, just named it Prod5. We can look at the sensor health for it. Uh, we can see that it, everything's healthy. Uh, Carbon Black is connected. Everything is good. Since we were talking about scanning, the very first thing that that I kind of want to look at, and if you're if you're looking at the actual console itself, where we've gone is we've gone to inventory, and then Kubernetes, and then you can go down here to container images. And that gets you this dashboard right here. So in this uh, cluster that I've spun up, it's already immediately begun scanning everything. Um, it's showing me vulnerabilities that it's found. Uh, it even found a malware, some malware in inside my um, environment. And so uh, if I click on this guy, it's going to tell me what it is. And we see here that there's a Monero miner that is running inside my environment. That's not good. It immediately tags it as malware <laughs> and shows me that, you know, I probably better do something about that. Gives me some image details, shows me those vulnerabilities. And sure enough, it's running XM rig. And that is the uh, binary that, that mines Monero coin. Now we can also uh, set up policies. So we, this is for the scanning. Oh, and let me show you this too before we go any further. So uh, before I started this morning, I ran a few scans in the pipeline. So let's look at this one first. This is in, excuse me, GitLab. And I ran some scans this morning. Let's make this just a little 
smaller. It's harder to read, but it's prettier this way. So I, I create an image, a container image. And after I can create the image, I run the carbon black CTL, CBCTL command, a binary on it. And I run this command called image validate. Here's the name of the image that I wanted to validate. And you see it has this build step here. The build step is also synonymous with the idea of a policy. And I have a policy called dev or my dev environment policy. And so it fetches the image and it analyzes it. And when it analyzed this, this particular image, it found known malware. And you can see here, the path is this dirty files path. I, I intentionally put some malware inside this container and sure enough, it found that malware. So it said known malware was discovered. Uh, it also shows me that this container had several critical vulnerabilities. And down here, you can see that validate finished with violations. And because the scan uh, violated the policy that I had uh, given it to, to use, uh, it failed. It caused the pipeline to, to end in a failure. So again, there it, it, here it is up here. This build step is the policy that I gave it. And if we go back, I'll show you where that policy is at. So if I go into policies here, or excuse me, Kate's policies, you'll see here this dev container build. And we saw that back over here, right? So if you look here, it even says that's the policy you were running, the dev container builds policy. So if we click on it, uh, we can see it here, we'll hit next. And the, the only two things I have on it are to alert on, on uh, critical vulnerabilities and to block on known malware. And because that, that scan found malware, that's why uh, the pipeline failed. And there are many other uh, policies that you could, you could add um, when you're setting up this kind of thing. But I just wanted to put in this critical vulnerability and the known malware. And the other great thing about this is if you have a dev environment and a prod environment, you can have different policies for each environment and your dev environment might be more permissive, whereas your prod environment might be more strict. Keep moving here before Roy yells at me. Um, so let's look here at some Kubernetes events. And this is under hardening. So under hardening, you have Kubernetes events. And if we look here, uh, today is the 17th, um, it actually is here. I don't know why we're not seeing it right there, but it is right here. You can see that this happened uh, this morning at 9.17 a.m. This is not time travel. I'm on the East Coast. So those of you on the West Coast, like, how did it find it already? It's not that good, uh, but but I'm on Eastern time. So we blocked uh, this, this image, uh, this Python extra. This is the one that I ran that had the malware in it. So this shows up also as an event in here that the image, here's the image, it's from my harbor that I'm running and it shows that it violated um, the policy that we have. So we get an alert here in the Kubernetes events. Uh, Kubernetes, let's see, what do I wanna go look at next? Let's look at this one next and then we'll, we'll see how we're doing on time. So remember I, I mentioned that I've got a crypto miner running. So this crypto miner, uh, was was put in by an insider. So the scenario that I want to give you is that there's an insider in your company. He's a developer and he's ticked off because you don't pay him enough money. He thinks you need to be paying him more and you've passed him over for a promotion already. And so he says, well, guess what? I'm, I have the keys to the kingdom. I'm going to start mining coin in our environment to make up for the money that you should be paying me. So he goes through a whole bunch of stuff. He creates a proxy uh, to hide what he's actually doing so that the, the traffic doesn't go directly to the mining pool. It goes through the proxy. <clears throat> he sets up TLS encryption with a let's encrypt cert. So it's going over HTTPS. He pulls his information from an S3 bucket. So he's not even saving his Kubernetes manifests anywhere in the system. And so he has planted a miner somewhere in our Kubernetes system. How are we gonna find it? Well, with Carbon Black Container, it's super easy because as soon as, as it saw the process running for the XM rig for the miner, we got an immediate alert on that. 
And not only did we get an alert on it, if we go ahead and, and click on this guy right here, we get alert details. We see that uh, we have resource hijacking um, and we can see even the exact command that was run in the container uh, and the process that was running. We get all kinds of information about it. And if we do click on uh, this process tree here, this is a new feature that's coming. I'm showing you some new stuff that's not quite available yet, but it will be in the coming months. Um, we're able to see the process of the actual crypto miner itself and be able to see it. And we can start working our way backwards if we wanted to. Uh, this is in the container and it starts running back. There's your container D shim. And we actually go all the way back to the node itself to system D. This is the actual Kubernetes node back here. You can see it's running on worker two. So we have that. And also if we go into, back into our Kubernetes and into our workloads right here, Kubernetes workloads, we have another screen where we see here, look at this core DNS pod. Why would a core DNS pod be giving us a risk 10 alert? Well, we see that we've got some violations on it from our hardening policy that I have set up. And we see that it says that this has a risk of uh, a high risk of 10. We keep looking down here. It says that this particular uh, core DNS pod has known malware. Why would it have known malware? What, what kind of network connections has it been making? Oh, look, it's been reaching out to support XM rig. Dot com and it's been reporting to some other fishy site called demo sale rat and if we look at the container image the image gives it away it's a monero miner so somehow we have uh we found our insider threat and we know that he is trying to here's the name of the pod he's running a, a miner inside our environment and so we're able to find that uh immediately um so I'll stop there. I just dumped a lot of information on you really fast um, with the demo, but there's a lot of really fun things to show. So are there any questions up to this point? Because if not, I have another example that I'm going to run through. And I believe for whoever has a question and wants to say it out loud, you could raise your hand. And we have the ability to take you off mute. All right. Well, in the meantime. Yeah, I was going to say, oh, go Nox, um, I don't know if you want to touch more on that uh, malware scanning and the malware visibility um, piece again. Just uh, run through that one more one more time to show show folks um, why yeah. that's that's really great for them to see in their console. Yeah. So the the if we go back to the container images from here, container images, and we look at this. Look at this. Um, what is what is really great is you can look at these images individually if you need to. You can go to your scan log if you want to. So, for instance, remember I said that I had scanned um, a few images this morning. Uh, for instance, like this Python uh, Docker and Docker. I ran that this morning. And so if I click on this guy, um, I can see here, I can look at the layers. So I can actually look at the layers of this uh, container and I can see like that layer is fine. All these layers are fine. Um, when I get to this layer right here, this is where I start introducing um, some violations. And so that helps a lot because now I can, I can look and I can see where I'm introducing the problem um, into uh, the, the container itself. And see where the where the where the um, excuse me the violations or the or the critical CVEs are coming from, and that's really nice. Um, if we look at that right below this one is that one that has the malware in it. So if I click on this guy, um, we're going to see here that it says right here like you've got this guy's got malware in it. And if we go to the layers here, um, we actually can see where where that's starting to happen at. So if we keep looking here, let's see if we can find the... Let's 
Oh, and this one is just because we copied it in. So he's all the way at the bottom. That's right. So there he is. So right at the very bottom here, all I did was I copied the malware in. And that's uh, that's why it shows up down here at the bottom. It's interesting, no vulnerabilities, but that's because we copied the file into um, the container and it immediately found it as malware. Uh, um, so that's, yep, good. We had one other question. Uh, and I'm just uh, answering it right now in the chat. Uh, I'm just a slower typer, but um, is this feature also uh, built into Carbon Black or CB Defense, uh, which is uh, previously known as CB Defense, but now uh, called uh, Endpoint Standard. So uh, to answer that question, and Knox, you can provide any, any clarity as well. But right now he's showing uh, Carbon Black container um, in that specific product, but the container visibility, um, that is on the roadmap for Endpoint, uh, endpoint Standard. Yes. So I'll take just a second and talk about that real quick. So first of all, the scanning obviously is only for carbon black container, the scanning of the images, but um, the, the uh, process monitoring that we were talking about, let's go back to alerts. That's what I want. And let's go down. I've got an alert here for the Python that I ran. Yeah, this is a good one. Let me make the screen bigger here so we can see it. Uh, Where'd it go? So we, if we look at this guy, this is the, a Python um, mm -hmm. command that I ran that's just associated. It's on a watch list for being a, a known command that malicious um, actors would use. And uh, this, this is in a container. So this is inside uh, a container that I'm running in my uh, Kubernetes right now. And we are able to see uh, the process tree now. And like I said, this is a new um, feature that has not, not been released yet, but it is it is very close to being released. And it is going to, if you have EDR, uh, the sensor, the Linux sensor is going to be able to uh, identify when you are running containers uh, on a Linux host. So let's say you're running Ubuntu and you just have Docker running on Ubuntu. Um, and then you have GitLab running in a Docker container on an Ubuntu server, you'll be able to see that GitLab process now. And if if a bad actor, and that's exactly what is happening here, uh, earlier I, I got into this container and I ran um, some commands that were, like I said, on a watch list. And so it sees those commands. I ran the curl here and the curl is reaching out um, to, GitHub and grabbing, you see here, Linux smart enumeration. So I, I, I curl uh, this GitHub repo for this recon script and it ran the recon script inside the container and it caught it, it found, it found that. And not only did it find it there, um, if I go back and, and again, this is just a Kubernetes container, uh, excuse me, carbon black container feature if I go to this network map, I don't have a lot running in here, but what little I have, it was able to see it. So I believe this is the container we just looked at. Yes. So this is that uh, container. And here's where I ran. I ran a reverse shell, but you can see also here that the network shows us, hey, um, this, this container reached out to this public IP address on port 444. Four, which seems like a strange port to be reaching out. And then we also see that this particular container also reached out to, to GitHub uh, over 443. And we know what that is because we just saw it uh, back underneath the process monitoring. That was, that was me reaching out and getting that recon script. So uh, this is great because you're able to see many different um, facets uh, of what is going on in your environment and you're able to to start digging in and, and finding the answers you need to find whether it's from network or from process monitoring um or from wherever it's coming from any other awesome. questions none so far um okay trying to think if there's anything else that i forgot to to bring up, there's a lot to 
to look at. Um, let's go back to the alerts again. Um, so let me uh, let me go ahead and talk about for a second um, the oh I know what I wanted to go back to I wanted to go back to this workload again. So these workloads I want to explain these just a little more. Um, what they have going here is if you if you have a deployment, see you can see here it's a deployment or a pod. If that's the if that's what it is, it's just a pod. But if it's part of a larger deployment, you'll see it as a deployment. Um, and what will happen is is that as you look at things, you'll be able to see if it has a violation, and you see this risk number. The risk number is there based on not just the vulnerabilities that exist but also on whether it has, now in this case, it's because it's a privileged container. Um, but if you have something that is allowed to talk to the internet or has um, has access out or, or has exposed ports, uh, that will make its risk higher. And so the whole point of these uh, this workload uh, screen is to be able to show you uh, and open your eyes maybe to some of your deployments that may have uh, more of a more of a risk uh, because they are facing the internet, because they have vulnerabilities, because they may be uh, violating some alerts. In this case, uh, the alerts that I have turned on are all in um, alert mode only. They're not in block. You can change these policies so that they can um, <clears throat> so they can also block and not even allow a deployment to get deployed in your cluster. But this is just so you have visibility of uh, the highest risk workloads that you have. Um, I'm reading and that question there. I yeah, was gonna ahead. say, uh, we have another question in there. Uh, it says, uh, what is the tool using for the list of vulnerabilities? Mm, as in um, for, for the scanning? I believe um, so, but uh, yeah. but Dave, feel free to ch uh, chime in in the chat or or the uh, or the Q and A if, if there's any quality there. Yes, he said yes. Yeah, I I uh, I know that they're pulling from several sources. Uh, I am not sure of all the sources that they pull from, but it's not just one. I know they have a couple different places that they are pulling from, um, especially now that they've added the malware. So they've got places that they're pulling CVEs from, and they also are pulling the malware. They're adding because uh, the malware feature is new. And so they're continuing to add sources for hashes for malware, um, et cetera. I know they're also working on um, being able to have your own uh, blacklist. So for instance, if you are a deny list, if, if you have uh, containers that are going into production, uh, one of the things that you have to watch out for is your developers sometimes will get a little lazy and they will leave tools in the container that don't need to be there. They'll leave things like curl or wget or some runtime like Python, something that doesn't need to be in the container when it's in production. And so they're working on uh, adding a feature so that you as a organization can say, no, a container should never have curl. It should never have wget. And uh, and those are only those are only going to be a a string match. It'll just look through the file system and match a string. And I've had some people say, well, you know, that's not a hash. I mean, someone could rename it, et cetera. But the point of the feature would not be uh, to stop a bad actor from renaming a binary. The, the point of it would be to help uh, watch out for just things that have been left behind, just tools that have been left laying around. So that you can you can verify that that we've we've removed the tools from the container before they go to production, and and that kind of goes back to the the part I was talking about where you can have policies set up for your dev environment, where maybe in your dev environment you don't have that deny list of of binary names, uh, but when it comes to a second round of scanning that is performed uh, before something can go into production, uh, then you could have a, another policy set up for your production environment, either for another scan in your pipeline, in a pipeline, or just a scan before it's allowed to go into uh, actually be deployed. 
that says, no, if, if any of these things on this deny list are found, uh, the image cannot go in. So that's to, that's to help continue to help you uh, be able to have good hygiene um, with those containers. That one, that one's also uh, in, the, in the works for this new malware um, feature that we've got. Awesome. Oops. All right, any others? Any other questions, like anything around like Kubernetes policies, process monitoring, stuff that he showed? Mm. I can go into the policies here a little bit. We can we can take a little more time on, on that real quick. So if we go into the policies here, um, hardening policies is what we want. So like I pointed out earlier, here's the policy for the scanning. This is the basic hardening that I set up. And if I just go ahead and click on um, the policy details, all this is, the, again, like I said, these are all just alert. I don't have them on block. Uh, so allow privilege container, it'll alert. Critical vulnerabilities, it will alert. Um, exec into a container, port host. There are so many uh, <laughs> that, you can, that you can choose from. And if I click on the violations, um, I get, uh, I can see uh, which containers have violated the policy. And this, and this, uh, it's showing me the deployments or daemon. Like this is a daemon set of deployment here. And the other thing that's nice is, is so I've got these these set up, but some of these I can't help. Like Weave, uh, that's the networking for Kubernetes. I can't do anything about that. So I can set an exception and say I, I don't. That one's fine. I accept the risk for that one. And this one is this one is from an intentionally vulnerable app that I have installed. And so no, I don't want to set an exception for that. This is for Cube Proxy, so we'll set an exception for that. And this is for the Carbon Black uh, Container Node Agent, so we'll set an exception for that. So now I have exceptions in place, and now I am able to um, add those exceptions. And now I can actually see which uh, which deployments are violating um, the policy, which is, which is really cool. So we can hit Save there. Um, and now we can click on our violations here and we can see who is violating what. And we can click on these, I think we can click on these guys in here. Oh, I guess we'll have to go look at them in the, where was I looking at them at? I'm going off script here a little, so. So here, so this is the, uh, if we were gonna make a, um, if we were gonna edit this policy, let's do that real quick because we haven't done that yet. Let's edit this guy. And I can show you a few more. So you're able to set up scopes. Um, you can have a scope that can be a cluster scope. You can have a scope um, set up on uh, like the container image scope is one if you want to have scanning in your pipeline. You can have deployment locations or you can target specific applications. But you can there's there's lots of ways to define um, a particular scope that you want a policy to apply to. And then once you've uh, created that scope or decided what scope you want, uh, you have all the rules that you want to go off. There, there are CSI benchmark um, rules. Uh, a lot of these have uh, alert, block, or enforce. So what enforce means is that it will, uh, it will actually modify the manifest and still let it go into whichever environment you're letting it go into, but it will, it will mutate the um, manifest to make sure that it is uh, the way that you want it. The one that makes the most sense to me for that kind of, for that feature, and I feel like the easiest way to explain it is with CPU limits and memory limits. So a lot of times when a developer is creating a manifest for a deployment or a pod, they forget to set up any kind of CPU or memory limits on that deployment. So you can have it set up to block um, we could have, uh, we could tell it that we want to, um, oh, I lost it. Come back. Little, oh, it's, did I click it over here already? There it is. So we could tell it that we want it to uh, alert, or we can tell it that we want to block, and then, there it is. Or I can have it enforce, and if I have it enforce, I can set a preset. And I can say, hey, uh, I only want uh, half a core, or I only want two cores and one gig of RAM. 
no no deployment should ever be bigger than two cores and one gig of RAM or whatever it is that you decide. And what that enforce means is that every time a, uh, a deployment starts to go into your environment that has no CPU limits set, it will automatically modify the manifest and add uh, the preset that you have here. Um, and at the same time, if it does have CPU limits set already, it will leave those alone. So this one's great uh, because you can you can kind of add a fail safe in there to make sure that you've got uh, something in place um, because you do want to make sure you have CPU and memory limits on your deployments. Um, if a bad actor is able to get inside them and you don't have them, uh, they can hog all of the resources of a single node and and expand it to as far as it can go. And uh, guys like me trying to run crypto miners in your environment. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure you've got these limits set. And if we hit next, uh, again, it'll it'll give us this screen again, which we've already seen where we're able to set exceptions um, on the on the policy itself, or excuse me, on on uh, your workloads that you don't want to be part of the policy. And then that's it, you're able to confirm it and save it. And then you can enable or, or disable um, as needed. And I guess that brings up another good point. Um, because all of these things can be set up uh, in alert mode, uh, when you install it in your environment, you don't have to worry about um, just messing up your developer flow. <laughs> your developers are worried about uh, being blocked and and not being able to work. Um, so you can you can install, uh, get Carbon Black Container running, and then put it in in the alert mode and start looking through those alerts, and then slowly start adding policies in that block various things that you know for sure you want to block. Um, and that way you're able to, to keep from immediately installing this and your developers are, are just come to a screeching halt because they can't, they have too many things that are violating those policies and, and it just won't let them do anything at all. So I feel like that's important to point out. You can, you can get this installed, you can put it into alert and you can begin to slowly start adding in the policies you want uh, and hopefully you have minimal disruption to your development teams. All right. Any other questions? We just have a couple minutes left. So yeah, feel free to add in any questions. Um, again, either to the chat or the Q&A. Or raise your hand and we'll take you off. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think if there's any other fun, fun things I hadn't walked through yet. Have you folks on this call? Have you guys um, seen carbon black container? Or are you familiar with it, or is this more of a, a total, uh, you know, entry uh, entry to this to this uh, visibility? Oh, that's good to know. Thank you for your answer, Matt. So it sounds like uh, the the tech is new, so not as familiar with carbon black container, but conceptually um, has some familiarity with containers. All right. Yeah, I think uh, I think I've about covered all of it. The uh, in my case, I will mention here. In my case, the my Kubernetes nodes are showing up under the AWS tab for inventory because I'm running a Kube ADM cluster, which is just running on EC2 instances. 
And uh, I know when I, the very first time I did it, I came in here and I clicked on endpoints trying to find my my Kubernetes nodes, which by the way, again, that that is not, uh, that feature is not out yet. That's gonna be coming out uh, very soon. But when I was testing it, I, I was frustrated because I went to endpoints and there was nothing there. And then I realized, oh, Carbon Black Console is smart enough to realize that it's running on EC2 instances. And so it's under the AWS tab. And so there are my, these are my two nodes from this morning that we've been, that we've been looking at the whole time. They kind of hide from you. Not really, I just didn't know what I was looking for. Uh, the other thing that's gonna be getting added uh, even further out on the roadmap is the correlation. So that when you click on these alerts, um, not only will you see uh, the node, um, but you will also see the the actual Kubernetes. Um, so if we click on this guy here, right now it tells us what node we're in, um, but they're also in the works and already uh, in, in beta in some areas of Carbon Black. Um, you're able to see the, the Kubernetes uh, either deployment or pod or daemon set uh, relating to where this event is happening at. So really exciting right now uh, because we are rapidly adding a lot of uh, new features into this. And if you have people in your organization that already know and love Carbon Black and are used to looking at, at these kind of uh, trees and this kind of information, uh, they will be able to quickly uh, feel comfortable with your Kubernetes environment and, and be able to, I, I think it helps them to really understand what's happening. Um, they'll be able to look at it and I don't think it'll feel quite as daunting to your security team when they're able to see these insights that they're used to. So thanks, Knox. All right. Um, I am going to say, uh, if you already have Carbon Black and you are um, you are interested in in uh, Carbon Black Container, make sure you hit your rep up and tell them, hey, I want to see Carbon Black Container. Hey, we're starting to play with containers and we're going to need to uh, you know have that turned on. <laughs> so do that. Uh, tell them that you're interested in it and that that you want to add that in. Uh, to your Carbon Black Cloud so that you can start getting um, this visibility. If, if your teams are starting to play with containers, you need to get it in early because what I have found with Kubernetes is teams start playing with Kubernetes and it doesn't take very long for them to start getting results and start getting things running. Um, but the longer you go without having some kind of security solution inside your Kubernetes and part of that, that deploy process, um, it starts getting harder to try to figure out how to add that in later. And and by the way, if your development team has told you, oh no, the Kubernetes environment is fine. You don't need to look in there. Don't believe them. You you need to look in there and you need to be able to have visibility. Just tell them you're doing great work, guys. We still got to have security inside our Kubernetes too. That's it. I'm I'm... I'm done. You guys can take it away from, from me. I love it. Knox, amazing demo, amazing presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined for interacting. Dave, thank you for your, your comments throughout uh, the webinar. Really appreciate those. And um, this was awesome. Hope you all enjoyed it. I posted my email in the chat there in case you have additional questions or you want to have more conversations about this topic or any other um, or any of the, of our customer programs and opportunities we have for you to join us for things like this and things where you could have your say, send me an email. We'll chat through it and I'll get you connected to the right programs, the right people and everything in between. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff. Hope to see you all at next month's office hour. I will be sending out information for, for that shortly. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.